There's a lot that wars against the family, against our households, against our homes. I talked with a leader, a Christian leader in California. He called me yesterday. I had spoken at a conference that he sponsored for pastors back in February, and they've been... Uh, They've targeted four cities out on the West Coast where they want to bring the College of Prayer. We've been talking about all that, but I said, first, tell me what's been going on with all the fires. He said, oh, Fred, we've had so much to do with restoring households. He said, the problem is no one has any notice. I can't imagine this, but as with all the disasters that have happened in the past few months in Houston, uh, in Florida, Puerto Rico, and uh, Miami and, and Mexico with the earthquake, and now uh, the, the wildfires out in the West Coast. They have three pastors that I know well whose houses have completely burned to the ground. In our denominational family, uh, there are uh, about 40 to 60 whose homes have been completely leveled, lost everything. And... Um, it's, it's just a heartbreak. But with all that's going on against the home, uh, God is still the protector of what is important. And he is the rebuilder of households. The scripture that we're looking at this month is Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, to ramp up to this, this incredible promise that God loves to not only save individuals, but to, through individuals, save households. We've been looking at the word household. It's the Greek word oikos. It refers both to the physical and to the relational. The physical is the building and all the stuff inside, and the relational is not just the nuclear family, the immediate mom and dad and kids, it's the extended household of all the relationships, the relationship of, the, of any adults and any of the children, those, the network of relationship that goes out. That's all household. And we're going to see how Paul was able to say with confidence, if any of you believe in Jesus, you will be saved and your household. God has been stretching my own faith for an expanding household and redefining for me household. And I know he's been doing this for many of us. Well, we saw in Acts chapter 16 in the first five verses that God expanded the apostle Paul's household by adding Timothy. Timothy was an adopted son, a spiritual son for Paul. He didn't lead him to Christ. Uh, Timothy was already a believer, but Paul became the spiritual father that Timothy never had, and Timothy became the spiritual son that Paul never had. Then after this expanding household, then Paul, not in a dream, but in a vision, he sees a man calling out to him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Kind of phenomenal. Well, Macedonia was a region. It was on the other side of the Aegean Sea from where Paul was located at this time. And he senses that this was such a vivid picture that he saw in his, in his spirit that he thought God must be in it. Now, when you think about that statement, come over to Macedonia and help us, you get three things going on there. First, there is the fact that they're unbelievers. These were people begging for what Paul had. So they were unbelievers, first of all. Second of all, they were hungry for what Paul had. And third, they promised to be responsive. Help us. We are eager. 
We are ready and we are willing. Paul couldn't shake it. So by land, he goes around the north part of the Aegean Sea and comes to the, uh, a huge city known as Philippi. We know this city because one of the books in the New Testament was written to the church that would later be planted in the city of Philippi. It's the book of Philippians. But when Paul gets to Philippi, there's no believers there. All he has is this sense that he got in his spirit through this vision he had of a man saying, come to Macedonia and help us. So Paul responds and he goes. Now we pick up the action in verse 13. And on the Sabbath, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Now, the word we is one we want to just draw attention to. When uh, it, it, we see that, what, what this means is the writer of this book, of the book of Acts, was in the group. We went here. The we includes Dr. Luke, who writes the book of Acts. So Luke, along with Paul and Timothy and Silas and who knows how many others, are now looking for the place of prayer, and they sit down and begin talking with women. So that's the setting. And among the group of women, one rises to the surface, and we pick it up, pick up the story. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be a faithful to the Lord person, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Now, so in here, Paul is teaching the word, and women are sitting there, and outwardly, they're paying attention, but inwardly, something begins stirring in this one woman, Lydia. It says, the Lord, working inside of this woman, opens her heart to what was being said. So the vision that Paul had is now being fulfilled. Not only were they willing to sit and listen, their hearts are being opened by God. So outwardly they're sitting, inwardly they're responding. Now this week, knowing that I was going to be preaching on this, this is what I've been praying for you. as my church family. That you wouldn't just sit there outwardly, but inwardly, God would be doing something inside of you to open your heart to the preaching of the word. Amen? We don't want to just be outward churchgoers. We want to be inward responders. That's what Lydia did. Now, she not only responded, it says that she believed and was baptized and her household was baptized. This is the first case that we see here in this chapter now, moving from Paul's household opening to include Timothy. Now Lydia's heart was open, but her whole household was baptized along with her. We don't know if Lydia was married. We don't know that she had children. What we know is she was a, a successful business owner who ran at least one, perhaps several, stores that specialized in purple fabric. Now, I've looked around the room, and I've located a few of you in purple. I won't point you out, but I, I've got my eye on you. Now, here it says specifically that Lydia, of all things, Usually if you've got a fabric store or a dress shop, you're going to stock it in all different colors. What she sold was purple. 
Let me see what else you have. Well, I've got more purple. That was what she specialized in. Now, the purple came, if you, if you enjoy shelling like I do, you might have heard of a shell known as a sea urchin. A sea urchin is a crustacean. It's actually in the sand dollar family. Sand dollars crawl. They look like perfectly flat, inanimate objects, but they're covered with, with what looks like fur, tiny little quarter-inch legs that move the sand dollar along. The sea urchin, instead of a quarter inch, has anywhere from one inch to 12 inch needles that move it along. You've seen them in aquariums. If you go down to the, the Georgia Aquarium, you, you see sea urchins in there. They're, they're beautiful, uh, kind of exotic. Well, they were, that is where purple dye came from. So all of her fabric was dyed by sea urchins. Hmm. There, you learned something. So she sold this purple fabric and made a bundle. Highly successful. And her household, those that worked for her, traded for her, helped in the dyeing process, who knows who was all there with her, but her household. It does not say children. It says household. Her whole the network of her relationships responded that day and believed, and they, along with her, were baptized. Now, this woman, Lydia, is the prototype person of peace that Jesus talked about. When he sent out his disciples, he said, look for the person of peace. The person of peace is someone who is peaceful, who is known in the community, has influence, and who is responsive and, and gets involved in a way that they even want to help. Immediately, Lydia not only is baptized, within, who knows, an hour, five hours, a couple days, but she responds to the gospel. And her whole household is influenced by the gospel. But then she invites Paul to come, along with his entourage, to stay in her house. So now her house is becoming a focal point of activity for the kingdom of God. It's a powerful example of a woman of, with resources and influence and power who uses that power righteously for the sake of the gospel. And how many women have come following Lydia who used what they had for the sake of the gospel. Powerful. But that's only the beginning. Follow it with me, verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her uh, owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul with us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Now, a second woman. The first woman might be considered unlikely because of how successful she was, how wealthy she was. She could have been far removed from the gospel. The second unlikely in the other extreme. The first woman, we knew her name because everyone knew Lydia. The second, we don't even know her name because she was treated as less than a person. She was treated as a commodity. Slaves were bought and sold. They had no personhood or worth in that culture. And so we don't even know the girl's name. What we do know is that she had a skill that was actually miraculous. She had the ability to predict the future for people, to tell them, what decisions to make, 
There was just one problem with this gift of prophecy. She did not get that gift of prophecy from God. She got it from the devil. It was a demon-empowered, miraculous ability that this girl had. And she, what she said was perfectly accurate. In fact, what she said was probably the clearest description anyone in the whole region gave to Paul and his group. These are servants of the Most High God, and they've come to show us the way of salvation. Now, is there anything wrong with that? The only thing wrong was the origin. Now, I want, us, I want us to understand several things here that are critical for us this morning. This month, there is more bad television than any other month of the year. There are more demonic movies, and I don't need to tell you the names, because if I said 20 names and I left out one, you might think, well, maybe I can watch that one. I'm not going to mention three or four or five or ten. You know the variety I'm talking about that elevate demonic power. This month, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord our God, please do not watch those movies. Please hold to a standard in your home. Please. Do yourself a favor, do your children a favor, flat out say this month we are not watching any of them. They are evil at the origin. The very curiosity to look, to see what's going on there is evil. It's evil. And God wants us experts in what is good and not even beginners in what's evil. If it's labeled poison, we don't have to taste it and find out. We just accept the label and we, we veer in the opposite direction. Please, people, can we make a, a commitment this morning not to watch any of those this month? Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I just had to say that. Okay. Now, as a pastor, as one who ministers broadly, as one who is known reasonably well, I have had to deal with the same thing Paul had to deal with here, and I'm not the only one in the room that has to learn. The, the accolades you receive make sure of the origin. No matter how accurate they are, don't listen to everyone that compliments you. There is a tonic of praise that tastes good. It's even enough to get high on, but it's deadly. And too many of my peers have drunk from that bottle and have been wasted. God showed me early when I began to get more and more invitations to go off and speak, to be extremely selective. Immediately, Paul recognized not the truth of what was being said. It said it greatly annoyed him. He didn't even sniff at the bottle. He knew it was evil in origin, and he eventually saw that he needed to put an end to this gal's prophesying even truth that was an, of an evil origin. Are you with me? No young ones that are coming up who are going to preach to far more people than I ever had, it have far greater influence than I've ever had. You young ones, I'm telling you, decide today not to sniff at the wrong perfume. Be selective in what praise you listen to. 
no matter how accurate it is. Because what the gal was saying was 100% accurate, and yet where she got the information was 100% wrong. And it was a good thing it annoyed Paul. In a sense, there's even a proverb in the book of Proverbs that says, as silver is refined and tested in a crucible, so men are tested by their praise. By the praise they receive. This was a test for the Apostle Paul, and he passed. And he turned toward this young woman. It doesn't even say he had compassion. All it says is he was greatly annoyed in his spirit. I don't know if he had any idea he would be pulling the plug on her security, on her cash flow, on her usefulness in that city, but he knew that she was a prisoner to an evil spirit. And that evil spirit was hindering the flow of the kingdom. And he turned and said to the woman, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her, you evil spirit. And immediately, that very moment, the spirit left her. And the power for her to predict the future was completely removed for her instantly. The next time some, some client came to get an insight, she had nothing. Someone else comes, nothing. It gets back to her slave owner. Hey, she's useless. She can't predict anything anymore. She lost the power. The owner finds out where, who took the power away. And it became an issue. Such an issue. Listen carefully. Her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, so they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them out in the marketplace and the rulers. When they had brought out the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they're disrupting our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept their practice. The crowd joined in attacking them. The magistrates tore their, their shirts off, their garments off, and gave orders for them to be beaten with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows on them, they threw them in prison and ordered the jailer to keep them safely. Having received the orders, he put them in the inner prison and fastened the feet in the stocks. What an incredible disruption! The kingdom of God, listen, the kingdom of God came on two households. The one, the woman responded favorably and her household responded favorably. The second, the woman responds favorably, but her household had fits. You say, well, what household? She was part of the household of her slave owner. She was part of that household. Now, in this household, there was an unholy alliance between the economy and the government and the demonic. The demonic brought into play what we call systemic evil. Evil that's rooted in the system. When the demonic links with the political and links with the economic, when the kingdom of God comes, all three will go irate. That's what happened. When Lydia responded to the gospel, the gospel comes on Lydia, everything's fine. There was no upheaval other than people getting saved and people were being baptized. But when the kingdom of God came on this woman and took her power to earn money, the demonic influences got upset. The economic shut down and the governmental tried to take control. It was this second woman who really, whose conversion really upset Philippi. 
It shook it to its core. When Paul presents the gospel to Lydia, it was like a major win. And he benefited from the hospitality of Lydia. Now the gospel comes on this other dear woman, equally valuable in the kingdom of God, but in this case, not only doesn't he receive the hospitality, he gets thrown in jail. He paid a price. Same gospel on this, the immediate same response, but underneath an entirely different response. We don't always know what's going to happen when the kingdom of God comes. Sometimes it's met with great fanfare, and sometimes all hell breaks loose. But the kingdom of God, when it comes, it's going to make an impact. And here Philippi is shaken. And Paul and Silas and the entourage, they all paid a price, and they paid dearly. It's an example of the persecuted church. It's an example of how when, if the gospel is going to help the economy, maybe it's fine. But when the gospel doesn't, I'm not sure we want the gospel. You see, there's something foundational here that we in a capital, capitalistic society need to understand. Capitalism values above all things positive cash flow. We live in a culture that values, at, on an ultimate level, positive cash flow. Brothers and sisters, we as followers of Jesus Christ do not share that common value with our culture. Whether there's positive cash flow or not, that is not our, of ultimate importance to us as followers of Jesus Christ, right? Can we have an amen? So in our culture, we have to be careful that we don't sell out to the economy for the sake of the gospel. That we don't compromise truth, even if it rattles some cages. Because I can guarantee you, the same demonic trifecta of the economy, the government, and the demonic is just as much active in our culture today as it was in Philippi in Paul's day. Now, Lydia forms a tremendous example of a righteous, successful woman in, in finance that honored the Lord. She had power, and she used it for God's kingdom. Praise the Lord. And it, she forms for us, whether men or women, a positive example of elevating Christ in the workplace and God blessing the work of our hands. But the other woman stands as a warning for every one of us who ultimately want to honor Christ, no matter what price we may have to pay at times in the workplace. The ultimate good is Christ, not positive cash flow. Sometimes the Lord gives, sometimes he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, today we're going to leave Paul and Silas in prison, in the inner prison, with their legs and arms shackled. But I want you to see where we're going to pick it up when we come back to this in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Even in the face of injustice, Paul did not stop praising the Lord. It's incredible. Here, he sets a woman free who was bound hand and foot by the devil. And he ends up being thrown in jail over it, bound hand and foot. It makes no sense. Except for the values of the culture that incarcerated him. But what does he do? Go in there and lick his wounds and feel sorry for himself? 
Did he ever lose sight of the goodness of God? Maybe for a while, but not by midnight. By midnight, God had him straightened out. By midnight, he'd come around. By midnight, he, he'd quit sulking or whatever he was struggling with. By now, he had reconciled the fact that it wasn't about him, it was about Christ and Christ's kingdom. And he was praising the Lord. And what we're gonna see is that when he was praising, the foundation of Philippi was shaken to the core. There was an earthquake that rattled the judicial system, that rattled everything because the kingdom of God was coming. Hallelujah. It's all about household. The woman whose name we don't know, she was an object in another household, a household that we would call dysfunctional. But the gospel came on her. Lydia, one we might refer to as a, a functional household. The kingdom of God came on her. So we see the spectrum of household. Even before we get to verse 31, where Paul says with confidence, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, not only will you be saved, but so will your household. And brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today to receive faith and hope for your household. Oh, you're a single person. So was Jesus. As far as we know, so was Paul. But God taught him household. You're in what may be considered a, a functional household. So is Lydia. You're in what you may refer to as a dysfunctional household. So is the woman. The kingdom of God is what defines us and redefines us and heals us and changes us. Changes us and changes our household. Father, we ask you to continue to rebuild even our view of household that, and expand our faith for household. To believe you not only for our own salvation, but for the salvation of our household. Lord, we've all got family members that, uh, that, that we love and some we may not love, but it's what we've got. And it's household, and your salvation is for all. We've got relationships and extended relationships and neighbors, and Lord, each one are significant to you, and they're all part of our household. And Lord, so is your gospel. And Father, I pray particularly for every one of us in this area of life groups, Lord, that we would not go it alone, but that we'd recognize that, that you love saving people and their households and that the salvation of Christ is ever extending and ever expanding. Lord, shake the foundations here in Tucker and Norcross and Alpharetta and, and Clarkston and Snellville, Lawrenceville, Decatur, Lord, in our larger footprint here in this region, Lord, shake the foundations. And Lord, you've reached us as individuals. Now reach our household. And reach our neighborhood and our community, our city, our nation. And through us, reach the nations. One household at a time. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together as we respond to him this morning.